My name is John Guppy. I am the president and founder of Gilt Edge Soccer Marketing. We are a marketing services agency based in Chicago, solely focused on helping brands connect with soccer consumers uh, in the US. And Heidi, I'm going to come to you in a second, um, but I'm going to start with our two guests here representing brands. First and foremost, on the far left, I have William. Uh, William is with uh, Target. William White is the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Target, where he leads all of their development and execution of marketing strategies. Uh, prior to Target's uh, arrival in 2013, he was with Coke, Coca-Cola, for uh, 10 years in both global and domestic leadership positions. Uh, and Jeff Ionello, sitting right next to me here, is with SeatGeek. He is the Executive Vice President of Partnerships, overseeing all of their sports relationships, including, of course, MLS and the six club relationships. Uh, and prior to that, he spent a number of years uh, in the NBA, both at the league level and also at the team level. So we're really privileged to have two executives here from two incredible brands that have made a significant commitment to the sport of soccer. Um, and I want to start by asking you both basically the same question. So the amount of sports and entertainment opportunities in America is, is vast. I mean, it's almost limitless. Um, why, at the end of the day, when you looked at all of the options of where you could spend your marketing and media money, why did you choose soccer? And then related to that, why specifically did MLS as a property kind of bubble to the top as a place and a platform that you wanted to activate against? So, William, maybe I'll start. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing I'd say is we at Target didn't choose soccer, uh, but our guests did. Uh, and so we followed our guests into, a sport, into the sport. When you look at it, um, soccer is a game that's played, watched, has rabid fanship among men, women, boys, girls, regardless of race, ethnicity, um, it really speaks to a really broad group of guests. At Target, we have 30 million people coming through our doors each week. And when you look at the people who are coming in, um, it's representative of the people who play and, and watch the sport. And so um, our guests really voted on soccer. And so we followed the guests there. And you know, if you look at our business right now, we sell over a million soccer balls a year. Since we started partnering with the MLS um, and carrying MLS gear um, and really upped our soccer assortment a bit, um, sales of our sporting goods category are growing rapidly, um, just well ahead of you know, the rest of our business. And so um, it was a no-brainer for us. Jeff? Yeah, Target is also the proud partner of the Ionello household, thanks to my wife and two daughters, so thank you for your support. <laughs> it's my story. <laughs> so for, for us, SeatGeek is a very young company. We are only 10 years old, but the real growth happened five years ago. We built a mobile app and then really 15X, and that's where all of the VC money and expansion of market share came into play. For us, it was really clear, led by our founders, that to grow our mission to have every person in the world experienced the magic of live, we needed to be able to partner directly with properties, leagues and teams, and be able to get into the primary market, the enterprise market. And the MLS was a natural fit. There was thought leadership and conversations already happening with Gary Stevenson and Kathy Carter at the time. Brian Pfeiffer, who's now at Minnesota United, one of our current partners, really led that on the club services side. And when you look at SeatGeek's base and growth, it's young, it's over indexing 18 to 34, it's heavy mobile, heavy millennial, heavy, heavy urban. And we saw this organic movement inside SeatGeek that was really similar to the type of fan that was experiencing soccer and the MLS specifically. And they didn't want the same old, same old, old tech that was, that was penetrating ticketing at that time. Right. And it, it just became a natural fit that they, they were the first partnership into our move in the primary in the US. Did you look at other sports? You must have done. We have conversations all the time, but they, it seemed really obvious that they were the most aggressive, <laughs> the most hungry for change, wanted to serve their fan differently, and knew that they had a different looking fan, somebody that was younger, somebody that was multicultural, a uh, fan base that was going to be attracted by something that was uniquely more mobile than the other options out there. Mm, so demographics, audience, I mean, both of you have spoken about that. We're going to come back to that as 
dig in a little deeper um, a little later on, but I want to transition and introduce Heidi Pellerano from CONCACAF. <laughs> <laughs> Heidi. <laughs> How come nobody else got a <laughs> round of applause like that? Do you have some fenders? <laughs> Fairly so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're not at the bar yet. Let's calm down. <laughs> um, I think some people have already been. <laughs> they have. Um, so Heidi, you've been in your position for since February. You were saying, but prior to that, I know you spent you know two decades at least in the in the sports and entertainment world, a decent amount of time at Wasserman, as well as some other uh, agencies. So. Um, let's talk about soccer and, and brand partnerships, but from the other side. So, as we all know, everybody in this room knows that soccer is very much, it's an industry, right? It's not a binary relationship, I'm simplifying, but it's not a binary relationship between a league, NFL, and a sport, American football, NBA, basketball. It's a collective of events, leagues, properties, broadcasters. Um, I'm going to look at my notes here because Don Garber mentioned this morning that there is more soccer broadcast in the US than any other sport by a ton, um, or a long way, I think was his exact comment. I'll give you the exact numbers. In 2018, there were 2,791 live soccer matches broadcast just on television in the US. If you average that out, that's 7.1 games a day. I mean, that's a ton of soccer. So my question to you is, um, it's a competitive landscape against other sports, but frankly, it's a competitive landscape within the category of soccer. How do you look at that from a CONCACAF perspective? I mean, what's your story to the brand world? What makes you different? What's your point of, uh, of opportunity? How do you kind of position your opportunities with, uh, with the sport? It's a fantastic question, and my stress level raised a little bit by hearing those numbers. But, um, you know, I think William and Jeff touched on it. Um, when I think about what CONCACAF has to offer, really is the most diverse fan base of any sport in this country. And what I mean by that is that if you start looking at we have our national team competitions. The audience that is attracted to our national team competitions is very different than what is attracted to our club competitions. When you start going down to our youth level, we also have a very different audience there. And then further down uh, the pipeline, if you start talking about our women's competitions. So when we try to talk to partners, we say, tell us about your segmentation. Because I can assure you within the CONCACAF family, we have a property that is the right fit for you because at the end of the day, if you are trying to talk to total market, we can probably address that with some of our properties. If you're trying to talk to the Hispanic audience, I have a property that can really speak to that. If you're trying to talk to the Mexican American audience that tends to be more on the Spanish dominant, we have a way to talk to you, just as well as we have to the third and fourth generation Mexican Americans. And we also are able to provide some of the niche uh, audiences that are very difficult to find, the Caribbean audiences in, in New York. We have a property that's able to do that. If you experienced our Gold Cup this summer and you had the opportunity to go to Red Bull Arena, uh, the stadium and see the, uh, the match between Costa Rica and Haiti, that's when you get to see that. And then if you went to the LASC stadium to see the match there between El Salvador and Honduras, very different. And I think that's what we offer. We can give you different audiences. We can segment. We can also give you uh, families, uh, women, and we LGBTQ community, et cetera. And I think that's the, the big differentiator for us. So we're back to audience and demographics. Absolutely. And we will come on to. Um, let, let's kind of bring together everything you just talked about. I think we have a, a video. If we could cue the CONCACAF video very quickly. Impressive. 
William, I want to come back to you uh, and dig a little bit deeper, if I could. Um, you talked about why soccer. You talked about the audience picking you as opposed to necessarily the other way around. Um, one of the things that, when, when you first made your uh, entry into soccer, one of the things that I was always impressed by was the fact that it wasn't a, a, a single relationship that you mm -hmm. created. Yes, MLS was an important piece of it, um, but there were a lot of other components to the relationship as well. And you seemingly took a very holistic perspective on how to connect with soccer consumers in the US. I want you to dig in and explain sure. the strategy then a little bit, but maybe to help set you up, maybe we can cue your video and give Great. some context to, uh, to that strategy. like it. So I, <laughs> for, um, you know, when, when we went through it, we saw where our guest was going, um, it became very clear we wanted to get involved in the sport, but we were also very clear that we didn't want to show up as a corporate sponsor doing a, you know, insert logo here kind of thing. We really wanted to show up in an authentic way, in a meaningful way, and uh, I think demonstrate to our guests that we're a fan of the sport too, and we want to make the experience that they already love even more fun and engaging. And so um, we looked at it as a, how do we start at the professional level and really go all the way down to grassroots. And so, you know, as we've talked about, um, we did a deal with Major League Soccer. We've just announced yesterday that we re-upped um, for another multi-year deal with Major League Soccer. Right. Um, very excited about that. Um, and we do a number of things throughout that. I think the crown jewel um, is, you know, what you just saw there um, at the All-Star Week. And we're excited to show up there in what really is a great week um, that's a true celebration of the sport um, and show up in ways that we can enhance the fun and really build, um, you know, build an engaging experience for everyone who's there, whether it's, you know, at the game itself or the concert that happens that week, even doing things locally in our stores in the market. Um, that Major League Soccer sponsorship also goes to teams. Um, very proud to be the um, jersey sponsor of our hometown team, Minnesota United, go Loons. Um, and, you know, we also just announced recently and are very excited to be the first brand on the, on the um, sleeve um, with LAFC. And, you know, obviously a really exciting um, team. We've been talking to um, LAFC you know, for many years, even before they were in the league. Um, and LA, California is an important market for us. Um, we're the largest retailer in the state of California. So we're excited um, to join 
to join the LAFC and not just be on the sleeve, but really activate in the market. Beyond the professional level, um, you know, as I said, you know, a number of our families, which is the sweet spot of the target guests, um, have kids who play soccer. And so getting involved at the youth level was really important for us as well. And so we are uh, the title sponsor for the USA Cup, the Target USA Cup, if you don't know, is the largest youth um, soccer tournament in the country. 22 states are there, 20 countries are there, over a thousand teams. Um, and similarly, you know, when families are there and spending a week um, at a soccer tournament, we wanna make sure that the, the experience is engaging for them. Beyond the youth level, we wanted to go into the communities um, where people are playing, um, you know, um, all year, uh, every day. And so we made a commitment when we joined the sport that we are gonna invest $14 million into the grassroots level. And, and approximately half of that goes to really help fund equipment, um, coaching clinics, things like that in communities where um, that's important to have that level of support. And the other half of that, we've partnered with the U.S. Soccer Foundation and um, are building 100 soccer mini pitches. You saw one in the video in Orlando um, in really underserved communities throughout the country. And I think that the way we show up there um, is really important and demonstrates the commitment beyond, you know, the flash and glitz of the All-Star Week. We, you know, we're running the gamut. Um, and again, I think that was important for us to demonstrate um, we're a fan of the sport and we want to support the sport and we want to be there with the families who enjoy it. Yeah. So do you feel like your portfolio is, maybe you're always tweaking, but it's essentially now complete and now it's about activating and bringing it to life? I think so. I mean, I think we've learned a lot in the journey. Um, I mean, the first year, um, <coughs> I don't think we activated to the fullest, and I think we were still learning, um, but I think that we're in a place now where we feel really good. I, th I mean, I think it is that. It is tweaking at this point. I think, you know, adding um, LAFC as another team is a very exciting um, uh, part of the portfolio. Um, the things that we're doing in the community, I think we want to continue to expand that even further, but it feels like we have a very good rhythm um, in the calendar. It feels like we have the right touch points across multiple levels. Um, so we're looking to continue to improve. We always want to get better. No, I think, it, again, I think it's fantastic what you've done. I mean, it, it definitely, I think, sends a message to the, the soccer fan and the soccer community that you're all in on this sport. Yeah. It isn't just, as I said, one activation element. It's a very holistic outlook. So yep. Kudos to you. Let's, um, let's jump back to this lovely topic of demographics <laughs> and fans. Um, I mean, I've been in the industry a long time, um, and I can remember in my early days when I was a sales guy, it was always about selling the quality of the soccer consumer more than it was the, the quantity. <coughs> TV ratings weren't there back in the early days. Crowds weren't necessarily there. But if you looked at who was there from a demographic standpoint, it was always hugely valuable to, to brand marketers. We started trying to sell soccer mums in the 90s, then the census came out and people realized that there's a lot of Hispanics in America, shocker. <laughs> Maybe I should use soccer as a way to connect with that audience. Then millennials became the hot topic for marketers, now it's Gen Z. Um, but I think this year, there's, there's one audience that certainly to me has, has squarely come into focus for, um, for brands, and that's the female audience and the female interest in the sport of soccer. So I know just because we've looked at this so many times over the years that um, female interest in soccer, not just female interest in female soccer, but female interest in soccer, men's soccer, the category of soccer, has historically over-indexed compared to other sports. And I do think that given what happened this year with the women's national team and the World Cup, I think we are at that proverbial tipping point where the female audience has now totally come into, uh, into focus. And I know, Jeff, from, from SeatGeek standpoint, this is really a, a demographic that you've, you know, you've identified, you've targeted, no pun intended, across the room. <laughs> um, can you share a little bit about your, uh, your initiatives against the female demographic? And again, I do think we have a very quick 30-second video that will set the context for, uh, for that discussion.
So we're super proud of it. It's um, the campaign in, it's in and of itself, you could look at it as coming together through new learnings and through channels that have already worked for us. The broad-based marketing campaign is there's a, we have a ticket for every fan. You could probably seen that in a lot of places and we've looked at different channel marketing to speak to an audience to help acquire new customers. And we found that there's been underserved audiences on a variety of different channels out there. And we mostly have seen these audiences living in long form. That's been the main overarching learning. So about four years ago or so, we, fe we feel like we were the original, not just in sports, but across any brand in podcast marketing. We sponsored at one point 50 or 60 different podcasts Seek Geek was sponsoring. It was underserved. We felt like that the value was really good and the audience was unbelievably engaged with the actual host, the talent on the podcast. Same thing two years ago. We found that by doing one um, e-gamer YouTube influencer and dropping a promo code, this audience that was watching a 10 or 20 minute video in most cases was way more loyal than many of our other promo codes around the internet. Um, and now we sponsor up, upwards of 200 YouTube videos a month. And after your intro, you might be the next uh, YouTube influencer that we sponsor. Oh. <laughs> um, but those, those, are, those are examples of audiences that we feel like were not being served commercially by brands that were, were not nitty gritty in the weeds. But we had never really looked down at the, the gender, the ethnicity, the age demographic of a lot of our core users, the people that were using it. We looked at it as, as blanketed and by channel how we were approaching it. We wanted to invest in marketing research led by our, our data and insights team to really survey and understand how people were behaving and also look at these demographics across the performance of our site. Where are they clicking? Who's spending the most money? Where are they spending their most time when they're actually in SeatGeek? And what really popped to us was obviously the female demographic. And then we went to MLS and worked with their team and said, are, are we, can we see correlation here? Are you seeing this too? And they saw, they had some stats. One that really jumped at me was female fans are one and a half times more likely than male fans to engage in social media. Hmm. Any type of social media, social media video, they, they seem to be, and our research showed this, much more digitally savvy than their male counterparts. We saw that across our soccer purchases, 42% of those purchases were coming from females. We also saw in our research that the majority of the purchasing decisions that were happening in households were being driven by females. <laughs> and we weren't speaking directly to them. So we looked at this as an unbelievable opportunity commercially to again, to, to visit an underserved fan and, and really capitalize on an audience that was craving to be spoken to for live events. And there's no better long form than live events. So, so expand on that a little bit. I mean, tactic-wise, I mean, how are you actually activating against the female fan specifically? So there's a number of different tactics. So I said, we, we look at the traditional channels that have been working for us. I think it's non-traditional, but traditional for SeatGeek. So a variety of podcasts that have heavy female audiences, female hosts like Katie Nolan, um, family, family YouTube influencers, just being savvy with understanding who that digital fan is on a very nitty gritty marketing digitally as they're tracking through our site, yep. understanding as we know who they are and serving them really direct advertisements um, through them that, that relate to them and just putting more performance marketing into a specific type of person based on our, our, what our data says in our warehouse versus a more spray and pray, mm. more spray and pray yes. tactic. Wow. People are surprised when, when stats get thrown at them. I mean, 47% <laughs> of MLS's fan base is female. 44% of the people that tune into NBC to watch the Premier League are female. I mean, those are significant numbers. And again, I, I do think that perhaps corporate America has kind of flirted with the female uh, opportunity through the sport of soccer in the past. But I do think that maybe we've now moved to a point where it's, again, very much in focus. And you know, Bud Light is obviously an example that was cited earlier today. So One of the interesting, interesting stats that I always jump at is, is my time at SeatGeek as a wow moment was, okay, will this, will this actually work? When we launch WeFan and we, we put the landing page out there and we, we measure it against other audiences, will it perform? Yep. And it, it's the most trafficked landing page in the history of SeatGeek. The ever. most trafficked ever? Ever in the history of SeatGeek. So I, I think that speaks to the fact that the female sports fan 
is craving to be spoken directly to. Mm, that's a great insight. So Wendy, from, from a CONCACAF standpoint, Karina gave us some really good insights earlier. Um, she was a fantastic speaker, by the way, um, regarding some of the competitive activity that CONCACAF's involved with from the women's game. So you can certainly touch on that, but I'm actually a little more interested in terms of how you're trying to connect to the, the female fan and less necessarily the, the structure of the women's game. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's an extremely important opportunity and you talked about approaching that tipping point and I think that's our priority to make sure that it is truly a tipping point and we can break through. I always use this analogy. I started my career at the NBA and then got started working in the WNBA and I sometimes hear the dialogue that's still going around the women's game and it's a little bit of deja vu for me and I'm like, but that was 20 years ago. So I was there 20 years ago, how can we still be having the same conversations? And I think that's what drives us every day. And the first thing we're trying to do is to make sure that we let everybody know that words are fantastic, but we're following that with action. Everything that we're doing, we wanna make sure is of the highest standards. And that is every small thing. We recently had our Women's Olympic qualifying draw. And that was very important for us. And all of us probably in this room are very competitive. We all love sports and played sports. So that was something we immediately did and we did our draw and we quickly went and looked at FIFA's World Cup draw and we we're like, okay, by our scale, this is good, right? We're doing it and I think people are gonna believe in that. We're approaching our Women's Olympic qualifying and we're making a significant investment in the activation that we're putting. And when we share that with brands, their initial reaction is we've never seen this in women's sports. So that's how we are showing our commitment, is to really make sure that everything that we're doing is out of the, of, of the highest standards and it's what most people come to expect of men's sports. And that's what we believe is gonna get people to follow us in this journey and continue to fuel uh, what we're trying to do. So when you're talking to brands, I mean, your Hispanic story is certainly leading the day. Mm -hmm. Where does the women's story fit in? I mean, is it, is it a relatively new story that we've been trying to tell? Well, it's- You've only been there for a few months, so. Yeah, no, but it's very interesting. I mean, I always tell that the best thing we can always do when we're talking to partners is to actually take them to experience. CONCACAF, yep. right? I don't think we can throw numbers and, and statistics and, 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 and show you great pictures, but until you actually feel it, I don't think you're gonna really grasp it. When you go into our games, you're gonna see entire families and the mom is just as loud and into the game as the dad. Um, the kids are into the game, all of them, the little boys, little girls. And I think that's what's really special. And especially on both sides, and, and that's what gets us excited about what the future is, because now we're getting even more little boys supporting the women's game. There's nothing more amazing than seeing the Women's World Cup and seeing these kids wearing Alex Morgan jerseys, Megan Rapinoe's jersey, like it's nothing. Right? So that to me is when you start seeing we are changing the viewpoint and the dynamic, but part of it is acknowledging that they're fans and not doing the old adage of like, we'll just make a pink, we'll do a certain uh, adjustments, and now we're speaking to females. They are uh, fans and they're avid fans and very few people are talking to them that way, except like you just heard described from SeatGeek and it's something that I know is very important to target. And now we hope that that's the evolution and that's what we try to talk to our partners. We give you the opportunity and the biggest advantage for us is, again, we have that very um, coveted Hispanic mom, yep. but we also have the very coveted uh, American mom too. Yep. Yep. John, I just add to that if people are surprised to hear that women, to hear, to hear those numbers and to hear that women are fans of the sport, I think they missed the memo that Target got involved in the sport a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. Um, we have 10 minutes left, so I wanna keep this conversation moving. So we, we've talked about the you know, why, mm -hmm. why invest in soccer. We talked a little bit about the, the who, the audience. Um, let's dig a little deeper into, into, into the how. Um, soccer obviously is, Soccer fans are obviously seen, no matter what the demographic, no matter what the gender, uh, as a digital first audience. Um, you're a tech company, so I'll start with you. Expand a little bit on how you're using digital as a platform to actually get your communications out there and how it's enabling the, the ticketing experience for the fan. John, it's a great question. The, the core fan of SeatGeek originally chose SeatGeek because it was an experience that was similar to apps that they were using in their everyday life. And that could be something sexy like Instagram or Netflix or something not sexy that we find easy like your banking app or your banking partner. And that was lacking in the ticketing space. And as we see the evolution of how people are using their apps and being more comfortable with 
getting served additional content and getting served upsells and cross-sell opportunities. I know firsthand, I have now found it easier to make purchases on sites that I would never make purchases on before because they're making it simple and they're serving relevant content. What we saw when we launched this past year is what we call our day of event app. And what that is, is that is below the fold of where your digital ticket is, where you're going to scan into your event or your match, you're served other relevant content that is, that is really connected to that day of event experience. And we're serving it through our SD, SDK with our partners. What type of content? So I'll give you two examples. So one is up through a partnership with Snapchat. We've taken what is now a digital experience and the ticket stub has now gone away in most cases. And we've created a, a selfie digital ticket stub where you can take a picture of yourself, here's the event you're going for, and you're posting it on your Snapchat story. Another one is in, in our partnership with the Portland Timbers in our lift integration, it now can detect where you are and what side of the venue and your lift ride can pick you up on that side, that side of the venue. And you can go on and on. We can see, and some of our teams are pushing the latest merchandise. We see, not to geek out on you, but another relevant stat for the female audience. They've told us through the surveys that the best way to speak to them commercially is through merchandise. So being able to actually have, have a female fan scan in, be able to speak to them through a, a female specific targeted piece of merchandise, you're gonna get more conversion than a stub and having to X out and redirect and go to a different site. We're, we're trying to make that experience happen in one spot. And we see that being the next wave of digital as you're going to live events, ordering food, maybe even integration of gambling, which is a hot spot, right? That's yeah. a really good place to put that. And if you have more eyeballs there, you have more power as a brand and as a team to be able to sell additional sponsors. Mm, gambling, that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> for another day. William, how are you integrating the digital platform? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that um, in the same way that we followed our guests into the sport, we follow them where they enjoy the sport. And so um, we'll do that in a number of ways, whether it's, you know, doing a takeover of ESPN FC or um, really engaging in the social conversation around a match, um, doing fan voting via social around a match to when we do something like um, the All-Star Game, we'll have a Snapchat lens um, that's fun and engaging and just, you know, another way that uh, we see people wanting to add to the enjoyment of the, of the sport and the activity that they're, they're partaking in. Mm Heidi, -hmm. I think I was reading that um, CONCACAF has really doubled down in some, some digital activations in the last you know, 12, 16 months. No, absolutely. So, uh, first of all, kudos to my digital team because I know they're all here. Um, but uh, the biggest thing, there you go. Hey, there you go. <laughs> um, so, the biggest thing for us is CONCACAF 41 member associations comprising North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Very unique confederation. Then on top of that, when you start thinking about the Caribbean and even um, Central America and, North, and, and Mexico, we have a huge diaspora of our fans across the world. So for us, digital is our ultimate connector. This is how we make sure that we deliver this passion to our fans no matter where they are. So that's very critical for us because one thing that I always talk about, you can talk about what happens inside the pitch all day long, and I'm sure everybody's gonna have an opinion on it, but what we are most proud of is what happens around the pitch. Our fans are just as avid as any other fan base around the world. You can, I'm sorry, you can go to a La Liga game, a Premier League game, an MLS game, wherever you are, our fans are just as avid uh, on the sport. So for us, they want more information. They constantly are seeking information, and we use digital to make sure that we deliver that. But also, we use that a lot to stream content to make sure that if you are in Anguilla, you're able to watch our Nations League matches, et cetera. So that's the important balance for us, is to use digital to really feed the fandom and give them the content they want, but also make sure they feel connected because also as a confederation um, you know if we were an MLS that have a, a season you know but for us we have we go from one competition to the next and sometimes there's gaps in between those competitions so how do we continue to feed that interaction with the fans we do that through digital content interesting um, so I mean I, I think there's been lots of really great insights that all three of you have, have shared and hopefully the audience has has picked up and benefited from those, but I want to put you on the spot just to close out here. Um, I want you to think really deep about the experiences that you've had marketing to the soccer audience and share just one insight that people in this room would be surprised to hear, they probably wouldn't know, 
give me a frame-breaking insight <laughs> that you have learned from your personal experiences, and I'll start with you, William. Um, you know, I mean, I think everyone here knows the passion of the fans, and so I don't think there's anything insightful around, around that to talk about. I think for me, the thing that has been eye-opening and, and really exciting to see is more at the community level. And so, you know, of all of these many pitches that we're opening, and I'll go to a lot of them, the reaction from the people in the community is unbelievable. I mean, when we were in Orlando for the All-Star Game, we opened a pitch there, and um, the commissioner of the school system came up to me and said, you don't understand, like, this would never happen here. There's not funding for it. And, you know, the school system's not going to do it. The city's not going to do it. There's not a community organization who's going to do it. Um, and it was, it was amazing to hear that, um, you know, we're building something that's going to touch the community. We go back and we survey um, people in all, the, in all the communities when we open these. And what we're seeing is 95 plus percent of people say, this has been really important for us. It's gotten our kids healthier. It's provided a safe place to be. Um, you know, our families are coming out here. And I think that um, we think about the sport in sort of the grand terms, um, in terms of, you know, the big leagues and, and, the, and the fans that are out there, but it's really a sport that touches the local community. And I think that that's something that brands in particular should think about um, when they're going into it, that um, there's real change to be had um, at the community level. There's a higher purpose opportunity there. Sure. Heidi? I think for me, um, it's how knowledgeable and, and sophisticated they are. Um, every decision we make, uh, the level of commentary that comes with it, you know, and, and they can uh, talk about what it means and what it means within the ecosystem of, of, of football, um, you know, and they go historical and they can quote all these things. And it's just fascinating to me because you expect it to be them to be passionate, to be, uh, to be almost personal. But the fact that they've done their homework and are really sophisticated and knowledgeable was a little bit of a surprise because every time uh, we work on a competition or, or tweak a format, they're commenting and they know exactly and they can quote every other confederation, what everybody has done and the implications of it. And to me, that's really very fascinating to see. Hmm. Jeff, last word for you. Two, the, from a B2B standpoint, the amount of sharing globally that soccer brings is different than any other sport that I've worked with or participated when, with. I mean, we had just brought a couple of our executives from SeatGeek and our partners at Cincinnati and Austin to our clubs and our partners in the Premier League for learning. And what is interesting to really piggyback off what, what Target is experiencing is the hyper-localized way that and the passion that the fans exhibit brings a unique opportunity for brands to interact with them that is different than fan bases of, other, of the other sports. Um, we see that, and I mean, the stat that really jumps at me always and how we look at the behavior is when you look at MLS specifically versus the other majors, over the last three years, there's been a movement of, of like 48% of the fans have found mobile app purchasing, app specifically as their, as their favorite and preferred way to buy something, to buy a ticket. That is a way over index of any of the other four, four majors. I think it speaks to the different, you know, the tech savviness of, of that fan. Hmm. That's a really interesting insight. Um, thank you, William, Heidi, Jeff. We're out of time.